For most of history, mathematics, the language of numbers, was used to describe the workings of nature. The ancient Greeks, like Pythagoras, developed mathematics to deduce areas, volumes, densities, and other aspects of nature which were important and useful to them. Isaac Newton was professor of mathematics at Cambridge, but he is as famous for the science he pioneered as as for the mathematics he developed to explore that science. His mathematics was all designed for the description of nature, the creator's creation. A biographer said of Newton, were it not for Newton's God, he would never have gone looking for his laws. Newton spent more time on and wrote far more about the Bible than mathematics and science together. Gottfried Leibniz was also a brilliant mathematician. He developed an alternative notation for Newton's calculus, making it much more generally useful. For the limited fields Newton analysed, his notation is quicker. But Leibniz's notation although more cumbersome, is far more versatile. Both used calculus to make great advances in science. Leibniz said, It is especially in sciences that we see the wonders of God, his power, wisdom and goodness. That is why, since my youth, I have given myself to the sciences that I loved. Leonhard Euler was also a professor of mathematics he introduced two of the fundamental constants of mathematics and proved a famous identity linking all three fundamental constants and the integers. For nearly half a century, a third of all the research papers published on mathematics, physics and engineering mechanics were written by Euler, about 30,000 pages of sheer brilliance. Euler said, In our researches into the phenomena of the visible world, that is, in science, we are subject to humiliating weaknesses and inconsistencies, that is, we make big mistakes. And he concluded that a revelation, with a capital R, he's talking about the Bible, was absolutely necessary to us, and we ought to avail ourselves of it with the most powerful veneration. Mathematics and science have always been inextricably linked, as pointed out by Robert Fisher. The language of mathematics, which consists of its symbols and their relationships, is very much at the heart of all fields of science. William Thompson, better known as Lord Kelvin, said, When you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely, in your thoughts, advanced to the stage of science. Albert Einstein said, Science demands the highest possible standard of rigorous precision in the description of relations, such as only the use of mathematical language can give. A very common saying among scientists is, mathematics is the most powerful tool in the scientist's toolbox. But in the 19th century, people like James Hutton, Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin rebelled against the Bible. Many mathematicians joined their rebellion. They rebelled against the idea of working to describe and analyse the Creator's creation. They demanded to be autonomous. They demanded a basis for mathematics, which did not rely on the creation, but only on the constructs of their own mind. Leopold Kronecker came to the conclusion that a basis for mathematics had to include the integers, the counting numbers, which had been around since before there were any mathematicians. He made the famous statement, God made the integers, but all else is the work of man. Georg Cantor's response 
was even more famous. Kronika needs God. I do not. He then put forward infinity, and infinite sets in particular, as a basis for his new mathematics. Of course, infinity is only a mathematical concept. It's the concept of a limit which cannot be actually reached. It has no physical reality. Mathematicians wishing to be free from the reality of the Creator's creation were delighted. From then on, they could feel free to make up systems of mathematics based on any mathematical concept they were ingenious enough to think up. But Kurt Gödel brought up a problem. It's called the incompleteness theorem. It proves that in any mathematical system complex enough to be of any real use, there are true propositions which cannot be proved to be true, and false propositions which cannot be proved to be false by the mathematical system itself. We can see this situation in a very simple problem. You want to make a square sandpit for your children to play in. You want its area to be nine square metres. How long should the sides be? Well, if we let the length of the sides be L, then the area is L times L or L squared, and this area is nine square metres. So the length of each side is the square root of nine, which is three, or minus three metres. Our knowledge of the creation tells us that a length cannot be negative. So minus three metres is not a valid answer to our problem. So we accept that the length required is three metres. But if we work in a system not based on the real world but on mathematical abstractions, how will we know which, if any, of the answers coming out of the maths are valid? David Hilbert was determined not to let this interfere with the new mathematics. He said, No one shall expel us from the paradise which Cantor created for us. And when he retired, he proclaimed, We must know. We shall know. Does that sound familiar? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But not all mathematicians joined in. Some decided to stay with the real world of the Creator's creation. Let's look into that next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.